Hello there everyone, how are you? I wanted to focus on this article, The Current State of the Border Fence. Um, this is a great article for a counter argument. In a very bordered world, and in, especially in crossing borders, and even engaging with borders, uh, they talk about how the sense of borders have ideological meanings, right? Especially in this week's Module 5 readings, uh, it's going more to a little bit of being very academic, right? Um, this example of the border wall is a metaphor. They started off by saying that the border wall is a farce, right? That its meaning isn't even really what they said it was originally. And as we have learned about borders, is that their uh, meaning or ideology or the idea behind the wall can change its meaning over time. And it's very interesting then this article, The Current State of the Border Fence, the meaning has changed, right? They even talk about it historically from the 90s until now. They also talk about how it relates to the rest of the globalized world. They try to argue that because other countries around the world uh, have border fences, we need to update ours and maintain them. After all, what does Robert Frost say in his poem? Good fences make good neighbors. And I just wanted to point out the sort of uh, picture here, which shows quite a few things. So on the far left here, you will see a group of people. And you don't really know what they're doing. It's just a crowd of people. They could be doing anything. And then layered above that, right here in the middle, you'll see some of these stars. It's the American flag. Very interesting image, right? And then here you have the Social Security card uh, in between. Permanent resident. Notice it doesn't just say um, citizen. It says permanent resident, which means someone who does this through the proper channels, as they call it, would become a permanent resident. And then layered above that is the entire world. Rather than focusing on America and the United States and Mexico, they're focusing on the entire world. And this article was designed by the FAIR group, which stands for Federation for American Immigration Reform. And you need to think about this. Who are they being funded by? What advantage would they have to making a fact sheet like this? And number three, what sort of bias do they have? Everyone has a sort of bias. But this group, I think in particular, really has a bias. And you can see it throughout the end of the article. They try to be impartial at first. They really do. But towards the end of the article, they become much more argumentative with what it is that they're trying to say. They start to go on the attack. They say that other people have log jammed them. House Democrats prevented them from doing anything, including some House Dem uh, Republicans, which in some ways makes the suggestion that this is run by uh, major Republicans and supporters of Trump. Therefore, those who aren't with them are against them. And as we all know, this us versus them mentality is exactly how borders end up taking uh, a sort of new meaning, right? It's not just uh, everyone needs to do what they need to do. It becomes, well, my group believes this. Your group is wrong because you believe that, right? And here they kind of make some highlights as to what's gone on and what's in the article. What's interesting, though, is that in most cases, all of this is actually in reverse order. So the, um, the idea that we have many border walls or fences around the world is actually here towards the beginning. And that uh, sort of these other things that they mention here actually come at the end of the article. So it's very interesting how they organized it. Okay. So I just wanted to show you some of the things that really caught my eye. Of course, the introduction makes clear that recognizing the effectiveness of physical barriers as a means of border control. Congress first mandated the construction of a border fence in 1996 
as part of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. At the time, uh, Bill Clinton was the one in office. And again, uh, at the time, they were just seeing what would happen if we made a border wall between us. There has always been, and you can write this down, there has always been uh, a sort of contention between California and Mexico. I read an article from the LA Times from like 1905 or even before that, and they were saying that there were a lot of people from San Diego, um, and they wanted to go emigrate and immigrate to Mexico. And they said that people in Mexico uh, told them that if you come down here, we're going to shoot and kill you. So uh, there's always been a sort of contention between these borders, between one country uh, to another, right? And then they mention uh, 2004 and the Secure Fence Act of 2006. I'm much more familiar with this because that's when I was going to high school. And I'll never forget, after 9-11... They created something called the Department of Homeland Security, which you're probably familiar with if you've ever gone to an airport with the TSA, right? And I remember part of George W. Bush's, and this was the person who took over after Clinton was in office, one of his big things besides the war on terror was also to create a, a border wall in which we would protect ourselves from illegal immigrants, which was very odd at that time because his father, George Bush, uh, about eight to ten years before, he was saying the complete opposite, that we should let people in because immigrants are some of the best workers that we can find. Very ironic, but that's how uh, things were, right? That's how things have been. And so now they say that it is extremely important to have a wall and that it was directed by none other than the Secretary of Homeland Security. That we have a reinforced, excuse me, reinforced fencing along not fewer than 700 miles of the southwestern border, which is deemed most practical and effective. But one of the things that they talk about is that before uh, President Trump came in. Uh, there was very little done in order to stop people from coming in other than tactical infrastructure. And they give some examples of this with some photos. The first is the primary. Now, think about this. They believe the primary way of people getting in is through walking. So they don't want people to walk in. They're going to have to struggle if they want to get in. And they do make a concession a little bit later that you can't stop people from coming in altogether, but you sure can prevent them from coming in. And this kind of runs contrary to the argument that is made in the border wall is a metaphor because they say human immigration is a right and that we should allow people to come in from other countries that are suffering. So, People can't walk through. That's level one. It's very interesting that they make a sort of concession about this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The secondary fencing is the one that most people are familiar with, which are these big old fences, which they say, well, if you somehow cross the first wall, we're going to make a second one, so that makes it even harder. So if you make it past the first one, we're going to stop you on the second one. But let's assume that you're still not done. <laughs> You've climbed two fences and somehow you still have enough energy. Now we're going to electrocute you if you try to jump a third fence. So this is the third way of doing it. So there's three barriers. First is just a regular fence. Then they got a larger fence. Now they got a barbed wire fence. So this is like a way of saying anyone who tries to come in by foot, it's not going to happen. And that is a big assumption, right? That is a very big assumption. And then their alternative is that some people might try to come in uh, through vehicle means. And so they have these sort of 
barriers that if you try to get through, you're going to mess up your car and it's going to prevent you probably from getting through and someone could stop you before you even make it to the other side. Now, here's the problem with that. There's one thing that they don't mention, and this is something that a lot of border security knows about but doesn't really want to talk about, which is that many people actually go underground. If what they say is true, then they should make an additional fencing that stops people from going underground, right? Uh, notice that they only talk about people on foot and people in vehicles. What about people going underground? How can you stop people from digging? That's another big issue. And we could talk about the fact that, and you can look this up yourself, that in Canada, especially Western Canada, there is no real uh, fencing or even any sort of patrol on the Canadian United States border. If what they say is true and that terrorists could come through, it would be really easy for them to get through via Canada. And they purposely don't talk about it because they mainly want to focus on the southern border. And there's this sort of question as to why the sun, southern border and what is its significance, right? So that's something to look up. I actually read an article in which uh, a um, photographer went to the borders between uh, Canada and the United States and he said he couldn't believe how open it was in comparison to the U.S.-Mexico border, especially here uh, in California. So I highlighted this um, paragraph because now they're trying to make a concession. They're trying to say, because other countries are doing it, we should do it. Kind of like saying, well, you know, I saw these people doing this the other day. You know what? I think you and I should do that too. But as you all know, that doesn't that's not always an effective argument. You can make the counter argument that and this is kind of one that people have said before. Okay. If a group of people jumped off a cliff, and this is logic and reason, if a whole bunch of people jumped off of a cliff, why would you follow them? Why should you and I follow them? Questions to be asked. And a valid one at that. Why should we be building a fence just because other countries are doing it? Does it make it any better, any more right for us to do it? Bigger questions for you to sort of think about when you want to make a counter argument. You can start to ask questions and then you want to answer them. One of the things I noticed is that a lot of people have good questions, but sometimes they don't answer those questions. They, these are rhetorical questions which means you think it in your head and then you give a response or an answer. So they talk about the fact that since 2015 to 2018, they have built more borders and now they have up to 77 border walls around the world. And here's their sort of counter argument statement. Notice that they make it short and they don't want you to really think about it, but they do add it in there. Fences. And I'm going to put the word although, okay, because this is a comparison and contrast. Although fences do not guarantee security, but they are an integral tool for securing borders and send the message that would be immigrants, excuse me, that would be migrants, people who come to this country, are expected to enter the country through the proper channels. Again, that would be through the permanent residency and visas, right? So if you don't have a visa, you're not allowed to come in legally. Although there's been a lot of questions about that and what is legal and what is illegal. Okay. Then they talk about the rationale for building a new and improved border fence. And they try to use economics, which is why I wanted to talk about next. So I'm going to kind of move on here. And they give an example um, from West Bank. And how much they think it would cost uh, up to uh, the estimation by Trump, which is the Trump administration, which is 15 to 25 billion dollars. Uh, technically, uh, that's about 1% of our annual budget, according to them, because they say we got 
oh no, it's it's less than one percent because we got four point seven trillion dollars in our full year 2020 federal budget. So they say, and this is their sort of counter argument again, as the result of um, the economics of it, here's another reason why we should build this border wall. Regardless of which approach is taken, securing the southern border is a sound, and I'm going to change the word fiscal to economic investment. The construction and annual maintenance cost cost pale when compared to the $116 billion fair estimates illegal immigration cost American taxpayers. Now, this argument is very interesting. They are saying, according to our estimates, illegal immigrants cost American taxpayers $116 billion. But where did they get that number from? I actually went to the source, number nine, and they would not show it. They said, you do not have access to it. So I'm thinking, where did they get that estimate from? How can they prove that they have no bias in this? A lot of people can make any sort of estimate. They could say, it cost us $200 billion. And they could say, if someone asked them, well, how do you know this? They say, well, we overestimate because there's a sort of a standard deviation of about 2 to 3%. In other words, they could be um, bubbling it out and actually making it much sound much worse than what it actually is. Because here's another part that they're not telling you. Let's assume that they're correct. $116 is how much illegal immigration cost American taxpayers. Now let's go to the reverse. How much tax do we get from illegal immigrants? If we're getting $200 billion from illegal immigrants and their taxpayer money, but we're spending $116 billion, we actually make money. So note that they purposely do not say how much money we get through illegal immigration tax paying. This is something that you could add in your counter argument to this article. Now, they say, if the project only results in 5% reduction in the annual cost of illegal immigration to taxpayers, the wall would pay for itself after only six years. We're assuming that this wall will prevent people by 5%. How do they know that it's going to prevent 5% of American illegal immigrants from coming to this country. I don't think they can prove that, which is why they purposely say if. The big word there is if. Doesn't mean it will, if. But what if less than 1%? What if it doesn't make any difference at all? Then it completely negates itself and we're losing money as a result. So that's something to think about. Finally, I love this part of the article. This is where, okay, we've been objective enough. Now we're going to go on the attack, okay? This is where um, they decide to attack using politics, right? And notice that the way that they talk about politics is almost very one-sided in a way. They even say um, Republicans and Democrats, and they'll say the House Democrats prevented this. They log-jammed it. They use negatives when talking about House Democrats, and at the same time, talk often very strong in strong words and very positive ways about Republicans, especially those who uh, side with Trump. Those who side with Democrats, they are given pejorative terms. Okay, so let's look at this. Since assuming office in 2017, President Trump's signature campaign issue has been limited much to the chagrin of President Trump's supporters and the president himself. Okay, let's stop there now. Chagrin means much to the anger or the sort of um, feeling of resentment from Trump supporters and the president himself. However, are they the majority of the country? We're assuming that, right? They're making that assumption. But what about the people who disagree with that? Where do they fit in? Notice how they use a sort of 
Well, we got Trump supporters and the president himself. We should be supporting him regardless of whether or not he's right or wrong. And I like that they actually try to uh, make an argument that given that Republicans control not only the presidency, but both houses of Congress, the Republicans should have focused on securing border wall funding. Unfortunately, since they didn't, uh, now we got an issue, right? And so they make a sort of, they're, play, they're playing what I call the blame game. They're blaming some of the uh, Republicans for not following what it is that they want them to do. And there could be any number of reasons for that, right? So you can make a counter argument against that. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and he is a Republican from California, introduced the Build the Wall Enforce the Law Act of 2018, but the bill died. And then what happened was, is that uh, after the midterm elections, uh, Democrats regained control of the House. And they made a commitment to blocking any progress on the border wall. The chances for obtaining sufficient wall funding from Congress plummeted essentially to zero. So, as a point of emphasis, they say, deeply frustrated, the president ultimately signed a legislation that prevented another shutdown. If you all recall about two years ago, there was a uh, sort of log jam that they mentioned up here known as the um, sort of partial shutdown. It was actually a real shutdown. People were not getting paid. Um, luckily, I was on vacation at the time. It was in December to January 25th, the longest sh such shutdown in U.S. history, though certainly not the first. And the problem was is that the president said, he wanted to cut funding from different sources, including the army, including education, including police force, so that we could use this money for the wall. It's like a build a wall foundation. We're going to give all this money that we give to other people to the build the wall foundation. And the House Democrats said absolutely not. And so they had a standstill. And it ended up not passing. And so... The president ultimately signed the legislation to avoid another shutdown. However, and this is also true, right after Valentine's Day, that he declared a national emergency to supplement uh, all of this here. So he still got $2.5 billion, but he didn't get uh, the $15 billion that he was looking for. And he, by the way, he changed the numbers over time. Now I'm going to kind of get through all of this. There's a lot of numbers here. But I want to get to the conclusion very quickly because I think this conclusion is really at the point when they finally are saying what they really want to say. In 2006, Congress required that a barrier be constructed, but that project was never completed. With illegal immigration, drug trafficking, human smuggling, an ongoing problem, and the threat of terrorism ever increasing, it is critical that a proper security barrier be constructed. So they're saying because of illegal immigration, trafficking, and human smuggling, and terrorism, that these are their four supporting reasons, it is critical that a proper security barrier be constructed. Now, as we have read in Crossing Borders, um, people have torn down walls, but people still have this feeling they know when they're crossing a border. The good example of this is something that I mentioned earlier. From Canada to the United States, you know the moment you enter the border between them, you don't need to see a fence. You know which side is Canada, you know which side is America. Why should we have to say we need a proper wall security barrier in the south but not in the north a physical barrier on the southern border is a necessity if our government wishes to meet its obligation to protect the sovereignty 
and security of the United States of America. This makes me laugh so hard because I think about a very bordered world and engaging with borders and crossing borders. So if you go back to module two, look for the words sovereignty and security you all mentioned in your essays. This would be a great counter argument to what it is that you're trying to say, right? If you were talking about a very bordered world or crossing borders, you mentioned sovereignty and security. And even though it feels like that, what are you really doing, right? And then here it says, this is the final sentence. Furthermore, a secure border sends the message. And here's the border wall as a metaphor. Here's the message. Here's the ideology. Here's the idea that we think the southern border represents. Pers prospective immigrants are expected to follow the rule of law. All right. So I'll talk to you soon. And we're going to discuss some of this and other some of the other articles that were mentioned. Thank you.